Our scripture passage this morning comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the first 13 verses. Listen here and receive God's word for us this morning. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become adulterers as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to pray. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to anyone. God is faithful, and God will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, God will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, obviously, something was going on in Corinth. Typically, the Apostle Paul proclaimed the good news and shared a message of grace unto salvation as the unmerited gift of God. But every now and then, Paul found it necessary to offer warnings to Christians in places like Galatia, Corinth, Rome, Philippi, and yes, even Pittsburgh. And such is the case and message in today's lectionary passage this third Sunday in Lent. This scripture reading is a lectionary passage. I did not choose it, it chose me. As I mentioned, something was definitely going, in, going on in Corinth. Corinth was a colony in one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. And by virtue of its location, situated between two bodies of water, it was a commercial and religious hub. Archaeological evidence confirms that Greek and Egyptian uh, religious shrines coexisted in Corinth, along with the Roman imperial cult, and some Jews had also settled there. Corinth had a reputation of having wealth without culture, abusing the poor inhabitants, and being a place where anything goes. One composer of letters characterized Corinth as superficially lovely enough, but inhabited by persons lacking charm and grace. And the wealthy people's behavior was described as disgusting, coarse, objectionable, denying the poor even the smallest amount of food." End of quote. Paul's letter to the church substan substantiates these claims. In his opening line, in his first letter to the baptized believer in Corinth, Paul addressed the division and quarreling the Christians were engaged in. Particularly, they were arguing about who belonged to whom, whether they belonged to Apollos or Cephas, Paul or Christ. Paul thanked God that he had only baptized a few Corinthians, specifically Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanus. You see, Paul didn't want his name caught up in that senseless argument. He reminded them that he had been sent to proclaim the gospel, not to baptize. As Paul's letter to the Corinthians continues, he addressed other problems that existed in the church. They were obviously still infants in Christ, still being fed with milk, not yet ready for solid food. They continuously argued and exhibited jealousy towards one another and continued to operate in pleasing the flesh rather than engaging in spiritual matters. The people of God were literally arguing about food. 
not about whether everyone had enough to eat or whether the widows, children, or the financially disadvantaged were receiving all that they needed, but whether they were free to eat food offered to idols and pagan gods. They were struggling with other issues as well. Now we know that in Christ Jesus that there is liberty and that Peter, when he was hungry and refused to eat anything he considered unclean, that God told him to get up, kill, and eat as what God has made clean we must not call profane. So eating food dedicated to idols or pagan gods was not an affront to the Lord God or sinful, but failing to feed or care for God's people who were in need is and was sin. One commentator states that Paul's first letter to the Corinthians makes it clear that they already were having their fair share of sexual problems, ego problems, complaints, lawsuits, and other forms of spiritual meanness and pettiness. Paul is as good as saying, shape up now or it might be the fire next time, end of quote. Now I assure you that I am not about to preach a fire and brimstone sermon this morning. A sermon that indicts and declares with utmost ferocity that unless we shape up and be about our father, mother's, God's business, we are destined for some place other than heaven. I have no intentions of going on and on about some of the ways we are modern day reflections of the Corinthian church, arguing about things that in the grand scheme of things do not matter. Things such as money, pastoral and church leadership, the building, who gets to make decisions, what music is Christian and high church enough, or whether we are an inward or outward facing church committed to walking with the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the oppressed, people living with insufficiency, or whether we should welcome people who have not had all the advantages that many of us have and therefore are not exactly like us. But let's get back to today's pericope. Although the majority of the Christians in the Corinthian church were Gentiles, in the opening lines to chapter 10, Paul shares the Exodus story of their ancestors, the Israelites, who were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, sea, who were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Paul is making the point that everyone freed from bondage by God were all recipients of God's grace, protection, and provision. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. In the words of an old hymn, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. And the Israelites were all freed from bondage in Egypt by God, but did not make it to the promised land, and Moses, their leader, didn't make it either. The second point of Paul's retelling of the Exodus story was to enfold the Christians in Corinth into the family of God's chosen people and a cautionary tale to the people. Stop your grumbling and complaining. Stop engaging in sexual indiscretions. Stop indulging in pagan activities and eating food dedicated to idols. Not because we believe in idols or that pagan gods have any power, but your engaging in those activities may cause others, those who are weaker in their Christian walk, to fail and to fall. Today, when some individuals are asked why they consider themselves to be spiritual, but not religious, and why they do not attend church or participate in organized religion, many often reply that Christians are hypocrites. We talk the talk, but we fail to walk the walk, especially once we walk outside the doors of the church. Just as Paul was making an indictment of the entire Christian community in Corinth, the world is indicting us today. We say we love the Lord God with all of our hearts, soul, minds, and strength, and we love our neighbors as ourselves, yet our words, our actions, our attitudes, and the way we walk in the world does not line up with that sentiment. Paul warned the Corinthians that the plight of the Israelites is a warning for them to not desire evil, 
not to become idolaters, not to take God's provision or protection for granted, not to engage in activities that defile the body, and not to engage in grumbling and complaining, lest they, they and we think we are standing on solid ground, when in actuality we are standing on sinking sand. Paul was talking to the church in Corinth as a community. and not to them as individuals. This message is also for us as a worshiping community so that we do not get caught up in the hype of who others say that we are or who we think that we are, lest we begin to think more of ourselves than we ought. That we not worship people and the things in this building rather than our gracious God and that we not get to the point where we think that everything or anything done in the name of Jesus is righteous and just, when in fact some of our actions and decisions oppress, marginalize, or harm people, and that we not be so heavenly bound that we are no longer any earthly good. Yes, tests and trials come. There are times when we fail to exhibit Christian love to one another and the stranger. There are times when we get so caught up being Christian that we fail to actually be the church. There are times when we place our faith and trust in self-made idols, specific people, our bank accounts or positions of authority, our acquisitions and accomplishments, rather than in the God of Israel and Corinth and Pittsburgh and East Liberty Presbyterian Church who provides and prepares a way of escape for us. In the words of Paul, no testing has overtaken us that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and will not let us be tested beyond our strength. But with the testing, God will also provide the way out so that we may be able to endure it. This Lenten season is a perfect time to make a rest stop to prayerfully examine our individual and collective selves as a community of faith. This is a perfect time to commune with the Spirit of God, to seek correction and a new direction. This is a perfect time to remember that we are a people who walk by faith and not by sight. And this is a perfect time to realize that God has given us a way out, an exodus route, and his name is Jesus the rock that followed the Israelites on their journey and provided the water to sustain them in the wilderness. This, is, this Jesus is the same living water that sustains us when we find ourselves in dry places, in wilderness experiences. This same living water opens our experiences to the new things that God is doing when we find ourselves in places of change. This living water helps us to acknowledge the truth and seek forgiveness when we have not been, been or given our utmost or our best to one another and to God. This is the same living water that rolls down as justice and righteousness like an ever-living stream. And in this living water, we were baptized into a gracious relationship with Christ who meets us on Exodus roads and leads us back to being who we are created to be. Examples of God's love, God's justice, God's mercy, God's grace, and God's righteousness in the world. Beloved, this Lenten season is a perfect time for us to stop and lean not into our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge God and trust and know that God will direct our paths and provide for us a way. Amen.